welcome back to another episode of Shaw Talks Politics, but this time it is the first official episode of Diplomatic Review because I've changed the name after studying abroad and kind of getting a, a little more international relations perspective. So now we're going to talk about international relations and politics in other countries, which is what I'm here with my friend Phoebe, who's from Australia, who I met in London. Um, we're going to talk about the upcoming yes, uh, like voice referendum in Australia. So Phoebe, tell us a little bit about yourself first. Yeah. So my name is Phoebe. Uh, I live in Sydney, Australia. Today I'm coming to you from the lands of, well, the Camaragal lands. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land past and present. Um, I was born in Sydney, grew up here. Uh, have lived in slightly different areas um, in Sydney, but uh, same city, so much for muchness. Um, I am currently studying. I'm at Macquarie University. I'm not doing a political science degree, so I will not pretend to know everything about politics in Australia, but I have followed it for many a year now. Um, and, yeah, we've got this referendum coming up on Saturday, the 14th of October, and it will be very interesting to see how it pans out. I've certainly got how I would like for it to pan out, but we will wait and see how my country votes. So, yeah. I just want to pause real quick. You said the referendum was on a Saturday? Yes. A weekend. Ooh. See, yes. our... we, we always vote on a Saturday. We never, That's... we never have, like, you can pre-poll, you can vote beforehand, you can do a postal vote. We always have those options for people if they're overseas or they have to work, but our elections have to be on a Saturday. I think kind of with the idea of it's then more accessible to people because you're not working Monday to Friday, even though obviously people still work on, work on weekends. But yeah, we have to have it on a Saturday in this country. We had, we had that conversation a lot. In, yeah. in the UK, like, oh, okay. I wish we did that, but this is a on a Tuesday. Yeah, it's on a, it's on the first Tuesday of November. So random, but it's and it's not different. even a, like federal holiday. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We don't as necessarily on any sort of day. It's just a Saturday. It's just got to be a Saturday. It often when they call an election for something, they do have a certain amount of time to call it. Um, so as soon as the legislation for this referendum was passed um they had a certain amount of weeks that it had to be called within and had to either be between this date and this date um couldn't tell you what the dates are now because it was a few months ago but yeah they have to call it for a saturday same for federal election same for state same for council saturdays so like earlier this week when we were planning this episode you uh told me that like this is the only thing that is being discussed so yep. How has the voice referendum become such a focal point in Australian politics? So it has been in the works for a while. So we had, so I think it was in 2016, we had um, an event where there were, I think it was 250 Indigenous peoples from across the country that all gathered at a place in Australia called Uluru. It's pretty much smack bang in the centre of the country. Um, incredible place. I've not been yet desperate to go um one day soon but they all gathered there to discuss how can what can we do moving forward how can we what can we do because um in Australia there is such a gap between sort of in a sense quality of life between Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians um I should say Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander um peoples in this country um and, you know, there is a lot of talk in politics of how do we close that gap? Um, and there is a project called called Close the Gap um, in terms of life expectancy, education rates, um, uh, incarceration rates, everything like that. Um, and so the Uluru Statement of the Heart, they basically, it's a one-page document, um, which also caused some controversy a few weeks ago in this country when someone was like, it's 26 pages. No, it's one page. Anyway, um, one page document basically inviting the rest of the country to walk together as one um, into the future and to have an enshrined voice to pump, a, yeah, a voice to parliament that is enshrined in our constitution so it cannot be abolished because we have had previous 
voices like this. So this voice is an advisory group. That is all it will do, but it will be, it will have to exist. Um, the details of how many people will be on this panel uh, is to be legislated by government. Um, and that can change over time because we have had this kind of a group, um, this advisory group uh, legislated before, but then, you know, you have new governments come in and they get rid of it. So that's happened a number of times where it's been put in place and then removed and then put in place and then removed. So the Uluru Statement of the Heart wanted us to have that as a permanent body um, purely to advise on Indigenous issues um, and legislation that would impact Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this country. Um, so, you know, it's been seven years, just about, um, and it has just been huge. The um, We had a federal election last year year was it last year yes it was 2022 um and a labor government won that previously we had a um the coalition government so the liberal national government uh in place um and with this change the labor government had gone to that election saying that we would have a referendum on what was proposed in the Uluru statement of the heart um and then earlier this year they started that process of legislating for a referendum, putting that to parliament, that passed, and now we're here. And it's just, you know, in the lead up to any sort of vote in this country, it's a big, <laughs> it can be a bit, of a bit of a big event, and especially because it is one uh, where there is a lot of misinformation and disinformation being spread, unfortunately. Um, it has just taken up a lot of airtime across <laughs> media, any format of it, it's been a lot um so yeah it will be very interesting to see sort of how it comes out because people will argue oh but there's not enough detail yes because parliament has to do its job to figure out the detail and that can change which is ultimately I think personally I think it's a good thing that the detail can change because then you can put one thing in place and go oh it's not really doing its job let's change it and then you could I can make it better hoping that you can make it better. Obviously, you could have a government come in and go, no, we're only going to have five people on this panel. Whatever. When, obviously, there aren't just five groups of Indigenous uh, peoples in this country. There is such a huge array of language and culture. So ideally having a good a good number with a good mix of people who are elected, again, all of that to be figured out um, later, hopefully also using the advisor of some people who could perhaps be in the advisory body, a body to advise on what a good framework would look like. But, yeah, it's been very busy on the news with that. Has anything else happened in Australian politics in the past three weeks? God knows. Uh, some things. But this has been the main, the main headline, that is for sure. I would argue that that's probably a good thing, all things yes. considered. Yes. It means it's actually getting the discussion that it should be it's getting the focus that it should be um it's being portrayed as important as it should be so yeah i agree that's great um so you, you touched on a couple things that i plan on asking you already but so you talked about different parties um what parties are on what side of the argument and what are other like key political actors on this Mm, so I don't think anyone would be surprised to hear that the Murdoch media is playing a big part in this. Oof. Yep. Uh, that's been fun. Um, in terms of the political parties, they have all, they've toed and froed a little bit. So we have a Labour government at the moment. They haven't specifically chosen a side. It's more individuals. They're allow allowing essentially a conscious vote, as far as I'm aware. Um I know that the, so you've got, so in Australia, you've got two main parties, um, really, you've got the Labour Party, and then you've got the coalition, and the coalition is made up of the Liberal Party and the National Party, so they're the Liberal Nationals. Um, on that side, the Liberals, I believe, have had uh, allowing themselves or their um, members a conscious vote as well. Um the Nationals, however, at one point did come out and say, no, nah, we're fully no. 
across the board, no. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure if anyone from the Nationals has come out in support. Um, perhaps they have. Uh, who knows? I have to double check that one. Um, in terms of the Liberals, there are definitely some uh, prominent liberal, liberal members who have, uh, you know, shown a lot of support for yeah, the yes vote. Um, and a lot of them have uh, sided with the no vote. Um, and one of them, uh, our current opposition leader, uh, Peter Dutton, <laughs> at one point came out saying well, he, he was never really in favour of a yes, um, but he did at one point come out and say, oh, but if it was a no, well, then if the Liberals were elected at the next election, we'd hold a second referendum for it. Now, referendums are not cheap to hold. They're a big event, rather expensive to hold something like this. Um, and, yeah, don't know why he at one point came out saying that. I don't know if he's really stuck with that since. Um, let's see. <laughs> That also depends on if he ever actually gets elected, which is also perhaps a personal opinion. <laughs> um, but yeah, the political parties, you've got another third party, the Greens, that would be very much yes. Um, and then we have a number of independents who would be scattered across um, either side, I imagine. Um, I think Bob, uh, you and I have spoken uh, privately about Bob Catter. Um I, as far as I'm aware, I think he might be, him and his party might be on the no side, but I would have to double check that one. That's a shame. <laughs> I know. He's, he's more focused on the crocodiles that um, tear apart someone every few months or what, whatnot. Right. <laughs> I love that video. It's so funny. So good. <laughs> so would you um, indulge us with, uh, what, what strategies have you seen from both sides but particularly the yes side yeah so i'll start with the no side to begin with um there's been a big push for if you don't know vote no um <laughs> yeah which a lot of people on the yes side of the debate have called out as being really rather talking down to people like if you don't know find out google it google yeah. what it's about Google what we're asking, have a look. Um, have a look at the statistics that are very readily available in which 80% of Indigenous Australians support the voice. They want this. Hence why of the 250 that attended to write up the Uluru Statement from the heart, um, I think only seven of them walked out. So that's still 243 people from very different areas, very, like, different cultures, different languages, that all agreed that this would be a good idea. Um, so, yeah, you've got that from the no side. You've also got a lot of uh, misinformation and disinformation from the no side about, oh, you know, this uh, voting yes will mean that we'll have to pay more in council rates, we'll have to pay reparations, pay this and that, which is incorrect. There's nothing financial about the voice except the cost just to hold it <laughs> um but there there'll be no financial consequences from it that has never been an aspect of this debate um so you've got a lot of that on that side on the yes side um it's been very interesting to see some of their different strategies um so they did start off with just sort of encouraging a lot of conversations. Now, this is all just sort of what I've seen. So I'm not, um, I don't want to pretend that I know their strategies from the ins and outs of them, um, right. just sort of as a spectator. Um, there's been having conversations and, um, you know, just uh, uh, looking back at the 1967 referendum that we had in this country that um, was to just include Indigenous Australians in our constitution because when our constitution was written up in uh, at the start of the 1900s, uh, we did not include Indigenous Australians in the constitution. They were not counted whatsoever, um, which caused a raft of problems, so I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so they did a lot of thinking back to that and how far we've come from that and how important that moment was and really drawing on that and the emotion of that. 
um, they've had some really beautiful ad campaigns um, with very iconic Australian music behind it. So there's this one ad campaign that really does draw back to that. And throughout um, this video clip, it's a lot of very Australiana references, very just niche Australian <laughs> moments and um, like little bits and pieces. Like you've got the pool room with all of this on the on the walls and all these funny things happening and little cute things. And in the background, you've got this song by John Farnham called You're the Voice, which I thoroughly encourage everyone to listen to. It's a beautiful song. Wonderful when you're in a crowd of people and everyone's belting it out. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's odd oh, to beautiful ad campaign. So they've gone from that um, through to having various high profile people come forward, um, encouraging a yes vote and encouraging just looking it up, reading it, um finding out what it's about um we had uh so they've had Kathy Freeman who um did very well in the Olympics for Australia in the year 2000 um the Sydney Olympics um and so she's come forward in support of a yes vote so that's been a part of it um as and I should mention as well Kathy Freeman is an Indigenous woman um in Australia and so they've had all of that. What else have they had? They've also been very unofficial parts of it. So we've got um, an Australian rapper uh, whose first name I can't remember, which is awful of me, but his, his name's Briggs. You refer, everyone refers to him as Briggs. Um, him and two Australian comedians uh, did, so Briggs is Indigenous Australian. So the three of them did this um, little skit essentially where it's these two white women talking about the referendum and like, oh, but how's it been for you? It must have, it must all be very exhausting because it has been reported widely that this referendum is having or is likely at least to have a negative effect on the mental health of Indigenous Australians while we're debating if we should listen to them. Right. Really? Um, but they did this sketch and it was just, beautifully well done where these two women haven't actually looked it up and they're like oh but we just don't know we're not sure and so then sort of leaning into that if you don't know vote no idea and Briggs just goes well google it have you googled it and it's just this really simple thing and that wasn't financed by anyone that wasn't financed by the yes campaign that was done by those the three of them plus the director I believe the four of them wrote it one afternoon and they're like how can we help this campaign what can we do to push it forward um and they did that and that's been doing really well that only came out I think at the start of last week sort of maybe Tuesday Wednesday I think and I read online that within two days it had about four million views wow um, yeah 48 hours four million views insane um so that's happened but that was not official that wasn't actually associated with the yes campaign it was just a uh, google it why is this seeming seemingly so complicated when you can just look it up you've got access to a phone you've got access to the internet if you do have a look so they've done that so it will be interesting as we're in the last six days of this it'll be interesting to see what happens next there are a lot of people at busy sort of train stations handing out things. I've seen some no pamphlets being handed out. I've seen some yes pamphlets being handed out. Um, I know people are doing door knocking. I know people who are doing the door knocking and also uh, phone banking as well. So, yeah, be interesting to see what happens in the final few days and if there are any other high-profile um, Australians that come forward to try and help the yes campaign. Yeah, in the final push, I guess. So that's interesting because that my next question was going to be about like public opinion and grassroots organizing. So what have you seen so far? And like, you know, like you said, we're like creeping up on it. What have you seen as far as like public opinion goes? What, do you think it's leaning in one direction or the other? Do you think it's tossed up or? I think I probably live in a bit of an echo chamber, <laughs> in mm. all honesty. Uh, my workplace, so I work uh, currently for a not-for-profit um, that does work with Indigenous organisations and so it has been 
my workplace has been very um vote yes but also if you if individual staff are unsure please come have a chat to us like we want to have these conversations and most of my friends as far as I'm aware most people I've had conversations with everyone has been very um very much a yes voter um my own mum has been very vocal on Facebook um about <laughs> vote yes which is very adorable and I love that for her because she is is in her 60s and so it's nice to see um her in that generation being a, getting amongst it and she's got some of her friends on Facebook as well who are very vocal about yes and also trying to you know get through some of that misinformation and disinformation and show that it's incorrect and go yes you've got these fears that's that's not what this is about none of that is going to happen if we vote yes in this that's just not and sort of trying to weed through all of that um, my aunt as well has actually volunteered with the Yes campaign to hand out pamphlets and have chats with people outside of grocery stores. Um, so I'm very much in a bit of an echo chamber. Uh, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, I was reading this morning that the polls are looking like it might be a no, but it's hard to know with the undecided voter. Because um, I think, yeah, the polls have been really ranging from sort of 45% no no, sorry, other way around, 45% yes to 40% yes. So it's very hard. And also with a referendum in Australia, it's not just um, the popular vote that has to be yes. It's a two-tiered voting system in a sense. So it has to be uh, not only does the majority of uh, the population have to vote yes, majority of voters have to vote yes, but you also need the majority of states to come out with a yes vote. Um, which I also learned a few weeks ago, doesn't include the territories because Australia has states and territories. Territories don't count in a referendum. And ironically, if we wanted to change that to include the territories in a referendum, we'd have to have a referendum to include them in the... <laughs> it's a, a bit of a nightmare. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we do need the two-tiered, uh, sort of two levels of yes. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and there are some states that from the get-go when you would be uh, perhaps more no-leaning, I believe they were Queensland and South Australia. I can't remember if Western Australia was also on that list. It may have been. Um, but we will wait and see how that all pans out. But, yeah, I, I've i seen a lot of people get amongst it. Workmates of mine have been doing, as I mentioned, um, door knocking and phone banking and volunteering whatever time that they have with the Yes campaign. Um, but I do think I live in a, in an echo chamber of Yes. Um, I've seen some wonderful social media posts by friends and family, especially friends on um, Instagram as well, posting things of come have a chat to me if you're not sure. Um, I'd love to have a chat um, about what you think. Also, um, one of my friends also shared um, what one of her friends, uh, an Indigenous Australian, had posted because there are Indigenous Australians who are very vocal no voters. Um, and one of them, uh, so my friend's friend, had posted uh, something that one of them, one of those uh, vocal no's uh, had said and he put a caption of... Um, just into price, so the, the woman who was a very vocal no, um, her name is Jacinta Price, and he, he was saying that Jacinta Price is Indigenous Australia's version of Pauline Hanson. Uh, does Pauline Hanson speak for all white people? For a bit of context, Pauline Hanson is an Australian senator who has uh, said some very questionable things over the years. Um <laughs> He's been involved in Australian politics since at least the 80s. Um, not in, not, you know, actually partaking in politics the entire time, not voted in the entire time. I think there was some time in the 90s or early 2000s where she wasn't actually um, a senator. But she did make a comeback in the past sort of five, <laughs> ten years, which has not been my favourite thing to watch happen, I'll be honest. Um, but... Yeah, she. I don't want to even try to repeat some of the things that she said. It's look if it would make sense if she was from Florida. I feel like that could maybe resonate. Oh, okay, with, I see. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that see. might make a bit of sense. It's, yeah. <laughs> so it's been nice, sort of seeing those conversations of 
you know, yes, this is an Indigenous woman saying vote no, um, but she is our version of this person for you guys. Obviously, there's no way that they can speak for every single person that looks like them has this similar sort of experience in life as them. It's that's not <laughs> no. <laughs> so it's been nice to see those sort of things and people encouraging conversations along the way. Right. Okay. I have one last question. Yep. And it's it's gonna make you think a little bit. All right. What do you think? would be the path forward for the country, regardless of what the outcome is? Yes or no, it doesn't matter. What's the path forward? Oh, yeah, that is tough. Because, so ultimately, personally, I would love for it to be, if you haven't already guessed, I would love for it to be a yes. (laughs) If that wasn't obvious. Um... If it is a no, uh, then that's what Australia has decided. Um, I'm not going to fight anyone on that. It's no point. Um, But I think we would need to take a step. Either way, whatever happens, we as a country need to take, take a step back and think, what can we do to improve things for everyone and including everyone in that? Um... Because currently there's so much data when it comes to that that specific gap between Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians. Um, And non-Indigenous Australians can't, we, fundamentally we have a different experience in this country um, and we can't, keep pretending that we don't and so I think we just need to go okay well how can we actually improve this what can we do can we all actually just sit at a table a raft of different people from different backgrounds different cultures everyone who lives in this country who enjoys the benefits that come with living in this country and what can we do so that everyone is actually included um and gets the best life that they can in this country, regardless of where you've come from, um, what your background is. I think that's what we need to do. And I think if it is a yes, I think the voice will help immensely for Indigenous issues because it will be an advisory body for legislation that impacts the Indigenous population of this country. If it's a no, then... I think we still need to have this conversation of, well, what can we do? Because we've not been, over the years that, clo- that this program, Closing the Gap, has been going on, we've not been doing as well as we perhaps thought that, th- that we would um, since that program's inception. So, yeah, it's a hard one, though. What do we do next? Cry? I don't know. <laughs> Cry, I like um, that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, that may be what I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Um, but I think just open, honest conversations across the government with various different people. And if we don't have an en- a, an enshrined voice to Parliament, then we still, that doesn't mean that we stop listening. Like that, having the enshrined voice meant that we would have to listen. Um, or well, parliament, all levels of parliament would have to listen. Whether or not they take on the advice is a whole other thing. Um, but I think regardless of the outcome, we still need to let people use their voice and we need to listen to them and take on whatever advice and sort of evaluate that and figure out what may be best because what we've been doing hasn't been working so well. So, yeah. That was a ru- that was a tough one though. <laughs> well, that's all I had. So, do you have any final comments for for the show? Oh, no! I think just be kind to one another. Don't yeah, just be kind. Take a moment. 
don't attack people for nothing. Not you on the show. I mean people in general. <laughs> um, like, just if we can all just sort of chill um, and take a moment and listen to other people's perspectives, I think we will get a lot further um, than if we just immediately start yelling things at one another. See, I think just be kind. There's a lot of Americans that need that advice, I would say. <laughs> yep, fair. <laughs> Well, that's all I had. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Of course. I hope that everybody enjoyed the first episode of Diplomatic Review with me, Kale Shaw, and Phoebe.